like to invite Avril now to um, come and have a chat to us about SPIs. That's, that's a topic we haven't, haven't seen for a while. So again, like the foxes, it's yeah something we, we need to cover a little bit more. Um, Avril, how are you doing? I'm good. It's been diverse today, hasn't it? really diverse everything it is that's what we like as pest controllers i think that's what we love isn't it that's what we love yeah. day in day out all different brilliant day in, day out. so it's apologies we're a couple of minutes um late but if you need another couple of minutes it's not, no, not at all. that's fine happy to crack on that's great all okay I'll just keep an eye for you and let you know when your video is sharing okay i'll share screen now mm -mm -mm -mm. there we go something's happening There's a bit of a lag, isn't there? Yeah, it's 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 fine. We're, we're all used to it, aren't we, now with the uh, with Zoom and what we have. I'm not yeah. touching anything, just gonna let it just gonna let it think thing. about it, have a moment. So <laughs> I need sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is delayed, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there we go. Can see it now, yeah. All good. I'll, I'll leave you to it. Thanks, Avril. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, hi to everybody. Thank you for still being here for now on the last slot today. So, thank you for staying around to see me. Um, so, yeah, we're going to do stored product insects, um, tracking, trending, and treatment. Um, I'm not going to do too much on the identification of them. We'll do a few things to compare between a couple of different common SPIs. But, yeah, let's, let's get into it. What are they? Hopefully, we all know. Um, usually small insects utilising stored food commodities, so not necessarily in just factories, you could in theory find them anywhere where there's stored food. Um, dry food, raw food, processed materials and then semi-processed materials, so all of those things. And then, yeah, remembering that the SPI is for stored product insects. Okay, um, so this is not, this is something that we might not all know. So SPI fall into different categories, primary and secondary mainly. Um, in primary, they are able to penetrate whole grains. That's really important. In theory, they could be potentially more damaging. Um, and within that primary category, we've got internal and external life cycles. So the internal life cycle goes undetected. And that is a huge, huge problem, especially for bulk stored materials such as grains, such as um, whole, whole foods. So, yeah, they can go completely undetected. We don't know they're there until suddenly there's holes all over it where the adults have emerged and gnawed their way out and you've got a hugely degraded stock that you didn't know you had and it's been sitting there and you can't use it. Um, so, yeah, there's a few characteristic signs that we'll see. I will show you the photos of those. Um, the external life cycle for a primary, they can still penetrate packaging, penetrate grains. However, they do not pupate or live inside the grain at all. They do that entirely on the outside. So it's completed on the outside of the grain or the outside of the material. OK, um, so finally, this, on this slide, the secondary centipede on fungus present on poorly stored or damaged products. So they're not actually feeding on the grain or stored commodity. They are feeding on things that are growing on it or in it. And in that particular case, if they're in it anyway, we can get a degradation of stock increased metabolic rates, increased temperature, and that then increases humidity along with their processes. And then we get an even more ideal environment to grow things like fungus and mold. So therefore they're self-proliferating, which can be again, a significant issue and degradation of stock and tainting of stock is the main problem, okay? So um, just, a, just a few common species. I will try and keep this quite a short list because we start on the store product. We can spend weeks talking about store product insects. There's so many of them. So these are just a couple of lists of the most common ones. Um, so we've got confused flower beetle, Trichobium confusum, red rust flower beetle, Trichobium cassium, sawtooth grain beetle, biscuit beetle, cigarette beetle, larder beetle, pork lice, grain weevil, rice weevil. There's so many, isn't there? Um, <laughs> more merchant grain beetle, flat grain beetle, broad horned flower beetle. Um, there's loads, mealworm beetles, spider beetles, <laughs> so many. The last four in there are all the moths, of, like most common moths anyway. Indian mill moth, Plodium punctella, mill moth, we'll do a bit about the monitoring of those as well. Um, tropical warehouse moth, all the aphistias, so warehouse moth on there as well. Um, so those are the really common ones. So, I mean, there must be 
others I mean there is others but those are the most common ones that I've come across through my inspections and anecdotally okay so um like I said we're not going to do too much on the ID but we are going to have a, a really close look at some of the ones that look very similar to each other so we have confused flower beetle to volume confusion red rust flower beetle to volume calcium um so there's a few quite actually real specific differences between them visually not too much we're just looking at the antennae different segmented different segments on them the clubs in the first four sections and then clubs in the three, the three sections on the red rust um so that's just this bit here um and then the other really really important difference between them is one can fly and one can't fly the elytra are actually fused in the red rust um sorry the confused they cannot fly so arguably if we have something that can fly and also crawl it can move much more readily therefore could in theory be much more of a problem than something that can't fly so if we do find we've got red rust then we might just get an indicator that we've got a much more serious problem because it can spread much more easily than the confused so those are those two um i'll just check for my things so on the right is the confused flower beetle and the left is the red rust i didn't want to get that wrong <laughs> so yeah really important to know the difference between the two basically because one can fly one can't Another very similar beetle, sawtooth grain beetle, Osphalus serenemsis, and merchant grain beetle, Osphalus mercator. So in my experience with these two, they do have different head shape, they do have different temporal placement, but um, most differences for me, especially in the field, especially doing inspections, is that most of the merchant grain beetle that I've come across have been in um, more sweet products. For example, every chocolate factory I've ever a visit in has always had merchant grain beetles somewhere it look hard enough and you'll find them they always have some sort of some merchant grain beetles somewhere again we look at the serrations look at the neck we look how large they are and a lot of the things are so so similar and some of them you might even have to have sort of an entomologist look at it to get the difference but the same things apply so it's the same treatment but they may be in slightly different products. They may be together. They may not be together. Um, again, we've got some really, really good, highly magnified pictures here because we all know they are absolutely tiny. And if you're looking at them without a lens on site, you're probably going to struggle. You're going to know that it's a small beetle in a product and that's about it. So again, that's where we can help as Pilgrim. We do have our um, entomologist and he can do an ID for you. So that can help long term. Yeah, but these are quite new pictures. We only just had these done. So yeah, really nice, highly magnified. So you can actually see, you can still the really see the serrations. You can actually see the differences as well. So again, we've got um let me just check because we're not gonna get it wrong. The um uh, sawtooth is on the left and a um mercator's on the right. So yeah, those two there, brilliant. Another few similar beetles, and arguably these if we've got them and we, they're not the normal biscuit beetles or cigarette beetles, we're the final one, furniture beetles and being being punctatum, then we've got a significant issue potentially, haven't we? Not just damaging stock, but potentially damaging the building itself and structural damage. So that's really one to look out for, especially as they can look so, so similar. We get quite a lot of furniture beetles sent in actually for ID. Um, so biscuit beetle, first one here, Segabi and Panaceum. Again, they've all got that really similar body shape. They are living in harder materials. They're potentially in finished products, semi-processed products, so harder materials. Um, and that's why they've got the head held down for that greater protection. Um, again, the Mindel, Cigarette Beetle, Lastoderma Seracani, and really, really similar body structure. And that's something we'd look for in these type of beetles. And of course, the holes. Another two, again, very, very similar types, grain weevil, Cytophilus granarius, and rice weevil, Cytophilus orze. So between the two, the rice weevil has these the considered distinctive brown red patches, whereas they're not present in the grain weevils. So there's those two. Um, again, really, really good photos. We had these done really recently, so we can see them really, really clearly. And you can actually see the four red patches. So they've come out really well on that one. They've got this, yeah, loads of pitting, loads of, loads of um, 
yeah, those are little tiny pits all over them too. Another feature that we look out for in the grain weevils is the, the rostrum here. So they've got that sort of like a tube mouth that's got the mouth parts on the end of the tube. So yeah, that really distinctive rostrum that weevils have. So just to look at some of the signs that we might look for, we might not always find the beetles or the moths themselves. So we look, I've got loads of photos here of lots of different signs, and this is basically how we're going to track them, isn't it? We can take records. I, when I'm doing my inspections, take a lot of photographs so that I can compare the same area time and time again on each, for example, quarterly visit. So I can track it that way as well, and I can give that advice to usually hygiene or treat. So we've got food debris in this photo here. There is a couple of beetles present. We can just about make them out. It's quite realistic, actually, because this is exactly what you'd see. They are tiny. You can see the size of them, absolutely small. So you may need to have a lens to look at them properly. Um, this one, we can actually see one of the weevils in it. They are rice weevils. But we've clearly got damaged grain as well. And it, that was literally pulled off a ledge that was um, grain actually leaking from a screw conveyor. So pull it down. And even then it's like the grain, you can see it's not good quality. It's been significantly degraded by that SPI influence. And even it's like, it's almost sticks together. So part of that sticking together is due to the, the frass droppings that the beetles and the moths create. So we'll have a look at the photos of that in a minute as well. More signs. This was um, this particular one. If you look really carefully, you might just be able to make out what's there. There's numerous beetles. We can see some sort of quite classically damaged grain here by the it is rice weevil in this particular situation. Um, these smaller beetles we can just about make out. These are cryptolestes, so flat grain beetle. Um, and also in this particular spot, so we've got we had flower beetle, normal sort of flower beetle, which was um, well, I'm confusing in this in this particular um and it was a drag conveyor um they've also got cryptolestes they've also got a, a rice weevil so we've got four there's even some um lesser grain borers in there as well so a real jackpot but really weird to find them all together in one place so from this sort of area i'd start looking above because they've most likely dropped down from above it is from a mill and you most likely get them sort of accumulating together if they'd been cleaned so it may be coming down from somewhere that's tailings or a, an end tailings bag and cleaned it to go to waste. And they've kind of escaped and died on the next level down. So, yeah, quite weird and good to good to look at it and try and figure it out. Because that's kind of what I like about it, the investigation behind it and finding a solution. Classic tracking. So we can actually see um, the larvae right in the middle as well. So we've got a larvae there. Um, obviously it's done quite a confused path hasn't it um but yeah single tracking it's it's enough it's a sign to trigger an action they need to clean it don't they possibly treat more tracking but in this particular area much much more extensive we can literally see it all over that would be from the adults from larvae stages moths and beetles in this particular um silo base Even more tracking. It's quite extreme, isn't it? Um, I don't know if anybody noticed my desktop when I switched slides, but um, I've got a photo of some very, very extensive tracking. And this is this is unreal, really, to find something like this. Um, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been cleaned in a long time. It could have happened over a very short time. You've just got a very high level of infestation. Um, you can see some sort of, of the beetles as well. This is this is flower beetles. Um, but what we'd also need to be aware of with tracking is that, especially around machinery, that we may get vibration and some of those actual tracks might not be store product inset tracks, they might be vibration and you can confuse the two. So, yeah, we'd have to look at that really carefully, but it's quite, it's extensive, especially on the lower ledge. You can see that they've cleaned the top ledge much more frequently than they have the ledge below. So a bit more attention to detail needed from the customer. store product insects in unusual places that you might not expect. So this was a, again, it was an interesting find because this is 
it's obviously it's very close up. This is actually a um, airline, so it's a, a vacuum airline. So they actually have a, a vacuum system in this particular factory, and yeah, totally, totally clogged up with all the beetles that they've been cleaning, and they've kind of not helped themselves. So ideally, we say yes, cleaning, cleaning, hygiene, but in this particular case, they've not kind of closed the loop, have they? They've not emptied out that vacuum system. So they're actually proliferating in the vacuum system itself, which travels across the entire mill. <laughs> so again, that's going to be an issue. But finding something like that, they can alter their procedure. They can ensure that that particular pipe, that system is clean and they can actually stop it there and then, can't they? Which is fantastic. They're doing the right thing, just not closing the loop on it. So, um, we do, we have, they have a larvae farm and that's something we'd look for. Um, this is a little video, it doesn't really show you much though. Um, so some of the larvae are distinctive. Um, this is, this is a moth larvae. This is Plodia interpunctella, so Indian male moth larvae. They have a distinctive green tinge. So this is something you would actually notice if you were looking at the larvae farm. Um, again, if you see those little tiny vestigial legs, pseudo legs, we know that they're going to be a moth. Um, and yeah, Indian meal moth, quite interesting. So if you can see those particular larvae, you know that it's what it's, you know what it's going to grow up into, it's going to pupate into. Um, again, can be quite useful if we can identify the larvae. Um, but it's not always easy. It's not always easy to identify larvae at all. Um, most of them we're quite good at. Our entomologist, he's fantastic at doing that. But if an entomologist doesn't know what the larvae is, they will actually allow it to pupate and then identify the adult. So that's how they do it if they don't know what the larvae is. Going into pupation, they'll weave a, a silk tunnel around themselves, a silk, a silk pupae out of all those really fine strands, and also see some um, fecal pellets. So you'll see this readily in anything that's infested as well. So you may find pupal casts, you may find um, larval sheds, you may find pupae themselves, like in pupation, Larvae again, adults, they'll all be there together. A few more signs. So, again, this is our um, rice weevil. You can see the cap got those patches and that clear rostrum. Um, again, they've got these classic holes. These are exit holes where once the pupation stage is finished inside that grain, the adult gnaws a hole and exits via that hole and then the process starts again. So these ones, interestingly, were they were alive for a couple of months in there, actually. That was just a sample box. Um, yeah, surprisingly long-lived, actually. Again, more damage to that grain, we can see there. But again, another reminder, they can live in the tiniest volume, like the very, very smallest amount of food products. More tracking, more spillage. Um, this is an interesting one because we can see the um, cabling here. That's an absolute classic for finding moth larvae. Can even sort of start to see some of the grass, some of the droppings here. And that's something you could you could pull that out. Look at that. There's also some beetles here, and obviously again, so much tracking, you couldn't be able to ignore that. More frass. So again, this has been pulled out of a machinery. Um, silk bound droppings, we'll find larvae in there. You'll find developing pupae in there. May even find adults. Again, more frass. Um, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't seen this for a long, long time um, the, of, of a large volume. I've seen frass, but we used to see a lot more volume of frass. Um, it could potentially build up to such a volume that it can actually clog machinery and clog cogs, especially in the areas where the spore product insects are, so in dead spaces, um, holes, cracks, crevices within the machinery itself, along conveyors underneath, gearing. So it can actually cause potential serious damage. But yeah, I've not seen sort of mass crass for a long time, actually. It's a good thing. Machinery is getting better. Frass dangling down. So this is ideal to pull down, pull it apart, check that it is actually frass. It can be confused with um, cobwebs. So I've got a, quite a good test for this. If you think it's frass, pull it down, pull it apart. You'll see the silk bound B 
bits in it. You'll see the pellets. You can see them, pull them apart. Um, if it's cobwebs and it's static, then pull it down and it will completely disintegrate when you do this in your hand. It will just completely disintegrate, whereas the brass won't. This is an interesting one. It's highly magnified. You've probably never seen frass that looks like this or even maybe larval sheds, but so larval sheds here, just to say the shed skins as the larvae shed that's going to grow bigger in that phase. Um, we've got loads of frass pellets here. There's loads, even, even more magnified frass pellets. Yeah, very, very close up. That's what they look like. Again, we've got some cases here, got some pupil cases, got fibres as well. So that's, this is actually um, textile moth, not store product moth. Again, that's something you look for. And you can even find textile moth problems within food processing as well. OK, so I think that's covering a lot of how we track them. But um, we'll have a look at the monitoring. So I've done it in a way that. Ideally, we'll look at the inspection first and we'll look at tracking them visually first. And then we can perhaps install monitoring. That will give us eyes there basically 24 7, won't it? And in between visits. So, monitoring detection, always key, it must be carried out correctly, it must be appropriate to the site. So, I'll show you a couple of things um, to do with monitoring. Um, hopefully, everybody knows this. We've got the black stripe funnel trap and the appropriate laws. So they are colour coded, they have a, basically a colour for each quarter. Interestingly, fly units actually play a part in this. Um, I've just put a couple of examples on here. So moths, biscuit beetles, tobacco beetles, that's what we can potentially find that are stock product insects in fly units. And we've got a standard unit here. But this one's actually on, it's from an actual site. And all those little tiny things that you can see there, they're all biscuit beetles. Biscuit beetles will fly readily. They are great at flying and you'll find them readily in fly units. And this is actually from a really interesting site because um, whenever they do a deep clean, they, um, they always see a, a, a right of biscuit beetles after. We always catch them in the fly units after. And it's quite interesting to see that because there must be an issue really, really deep down in some of their machinery that we can't physically get to, but when it's cleaned, they have a, a CIP system, when it's cleaned, when it goes through, it must clean it out and it must disturb them. So we see them each time they clean. So that's something that I actually put into the report and say, there's a recent clean being carried out and that's the reason for the uplift in those biscuit beetles that have been seen. A couple of other monitoring devices and traps. So this is a pitfall trap. Um, it's useful for sort of stored product um, in bulk. Um, you can add a lure to it if you want to. Crawling insect monitor, it is just basically a blunder type trap, but it does have a, a generalized insect attractant within the glue, so it does have a, a slight insect attractant. This is an interesting one. So this is a hyresis lure. This is specifically for biscuit beetles. Um, if you wanted to, you could add it to a pitfall trap, you could add it to a crawling insect monitor, um, and that would pick up biscuit beetles. This is the XLAR MST, so again, a really interesting trap. It's got um, two pheromones, three food laws, um, sticky, it's all round stored product insect trap, the MST multi-species trap. Um, I'll pick up on this later, but it does also have a, a mite attractant in it. So I'm gonna I'll finish off on mites today. Another classic, the demi diamond. Um, I've got the, both the grids are depicted there, but we'd have the the green grid, the one at the back here, the green grid for um, Ephysia and Polodium moth, and then the blue one is your textile moth. So make sure you've got the right board in. Um, they've also got the, the setup here as well for these. So it's quite important to actually set your demi diamonds up every 10 metres in that grid system. Um, a warehouse is a good example. Every 10 metres, if it's more than 10 metres high, you'd also need them at the higher levels. So you'd have 10 metres high as well. So you may have them around the top level too, monitor that stock. Um, demi diamonds are fantastic for pinpointing and locating areas, particularly if there's a specific area or a specific stock item that is your breeding source or it's been brought in and they are on that product. 
So obviously moth, but they are unbeatable for pinpointing source and general monitoring. So this is, it's not, it's not really a monitor. It is a, a type of treatment. So if nobody's seen this before, I, probably some of you have, but this is called Dismate PE. Um, it's not something you use in somebody's house. It's probably a bit overkill for somebody's house. But if you're in that sort of commercial or industrial setting and you need to monitor, again, for um, Fistia pallodia moth, particularly if they've got issues, um, this can be fantastic. It's the same pheromones that are used in the, um, the normal mo monitors, the normal demi diamonds and the normal black stripe funnel trap. Same colours, so you have a colour per colour code for it. The blue basically starts off in January, um, and you change them every quarter, the same as the other. But the levels of pheromone are over and above what you'd get from your normal monitoring. It is basically flooding that particular area around the monitor, slow release, um, and yeah, they they work by basically again like all the other pheromone attractants attracting the males and if you've ever seen this mate in action um i've got a video but it shows the customer so i can't show it but it's amazing you walk up to one of these monitors and um, one of these um this mate sachets and there's literally a cloud of these male moths all around it thinking it's a female you just have to sort of waft them up waft them away because there's so many all just crowding around it and um yeah it, they work really well there's there is drawbacks but in theory, they work really well. Um, the, the only issue is that they can't treat um, products. So they'll attract moths away from it. But in, if, the, if the site doesn't clean, if they're not doing what they need to as part of their recommendations, then it is going to work. It is going to attract them. But it's not, a, it's not a cure. They still need to do that cleaning. They still need to do that hygiene to, to get on top of the issue. But it's a really interesting product to know about. Um, setting it up in line with the normal monitoring system. You can leave your normal monitoring system in if there's moth monitoring already installed. Um, you can leave that in the same, but you'd cite your dismay slightly away from it. So it is powerful enough to actually pull it away from the normal monitors. But again, that's something to watch out for. Um, I've done it on trending and you can see when they've installed this mate, all your numbers in your moth traps actually dramatically drop because those males are after the more potent pheromone that's in this mate as opposed to the monitoring systems. That's it's just a bit of education, something to look out for. Inspection, where to look? So um, there's a, a, a massive list there, pretty much everywhere. I won't go through it, but there's, yeah, pretty much everywhere. Um, there is another note on here as well. So there isn't really any natural predators for store product insects. Um, but there is a small parasitoid wasp that you can find. Depends on what it is. The one pictured actually in this photo is from a site that I do, but it's um, it's a it's more specific to Lepidoptera, so it's moth. So again, that's they're feeding on the they feed the parasitizing the moth larvae, which is interesting because it's a secondary pest, but something that you might notice first before realizing there's an actual star product problem. So yeah, it's, it's obviously it's massively massively. They're about a centimeter. They're quite large. Trending, a few points on here. So use the data from your monitors in conjunction with plans and maps. You could even heat map if you wanted to. Um, expect seasonal trends in line with outside as it warms up, we'll see more. Use hotspots for high accounts and pinpoint sources. Again, that'd be fantastic for something like a warehouse, um, even in production machinery. Um, also can help indicate successful treatment or a procedure. If the site has been intensively cleaning and all the monitors are showing less moth or less beetle, that's something to be aware of and that's something to say, this is working, keep on doing it. Um, we've also got dye pausing on here. So beware of dye pausing affecting figures. Um, moths particularly, um, particularly Fistia, well known to dye pause. Um, I've seen some sort of some figures from a, a paper and it was saying that over a 12 week period of minus five, there was very low mortality of dye pausing larvae for um, Fistia species, moths, Fistia elitella. And so minus five for 12 weeks, that's extreme. But when they're in that phase, when they're in that larval phase, they can completely basically shut themselves down. Metabolism just ticking over. And that's when you'd see that diapause kicking in and you wouldn't see any. 
So as soon as it warms up, you'd get a massive increase and your customers ringing you saying, the treatment hasn't worked. It's, it's, not, it's not worked at all. We need it doing again. And it's because they're in diapers. So final little section, I'll do some really quickly on some stored product pests. I've noticed I've changed it to store product pests, not store product insects because mites are not insects, they're arachnids. So um, we've the reason why I put this in is because we've had quite an uplift in calls about mites actually this year. Um, it's been ideal temperature, ideal humidity, and that's basically what's been fueling the mite issues that we've come across. Um, commonly, you'll come across the grain mite or flower mites, the same, Acrostura, um, very, very small, <laughs> um, very, very small. You'll see the, you see the setae from the posterior look quite fluffy. Um, they'll see pinky legs, pearly iridescent, white body. Um, I'll show it even more magnified there. So hugely magnified, quite scary. <laughs> Another mite that has experienced an uplift, household furniture mites, again, even smaller. So you would perhaps struggle to see these with the naked eye, generally gray coloration as well. So they blend in. Just see some of the individuals there and in some dust and debris. So this is, um, this is kind of a real life photo that I took. Um, this is at around 20 magnification. So, so you can see all the mites there, but it's not that clear. And they are really, really small. They're probably one of the smallest pests that we can actually deal with. Um, and yeah, just to give you an idea that they are really small. If you hold them there long enough, they will move. You will see them move. Um, it can also do a trick with a sort of piece of dark card or dark paper and put them on there and put the debris on there and you'll see it move. You'll see it migrate away from where you put it. Okay, couple of key factors, mostly for, for mites, it is moisture. So that humidity that they need, minimum 65% relative humidity, um, that's just above what a normal sort of room would be. Um, and don't forget that you can get microclimates within stored products as well. So in those cracks and crevices, even within a pallet, between sacks, between packaging, you can get a microclimate that can be more humid. Um, our issue is that they are actually in the food, they're in the product, um, and they're feeding on microscopic moulds and fungi that are in the product itself. Um, and then also warmth. So most of our store product insects are warmth and humidity related. But whereas our main issue with ordinary stored product insects is that they actually taint stock and cause the problem with product quality, um, mites are well known for causing allergies and that's something to be really aware of that somebody especially a sensitized individual can have a quite extreme reaction to being exposed to mites and um, also another precaution is that because mites are classed as arachnids then you'd need to use a product that's labeled for mites something that's got mites on the authorization not all products have authorization for mites Okay, for our mites, what to look for? Grade flower is clearly tainted. Um, products that are more dull in coloration, again, they've been tainted. They've been affected by potential mold and fungus in the first place, which is then being consumed by the mites. Um, product that has been reduced to dust, this is a good one, call it mite dust. And it is actually the sort of um, fast that the mites produce and also the remnants of the products that they've been eating mold and fungus off and therefore it's degraded. Um, again, this is another thing we can do at the bottom. You can use sticky tapes, you can use some of the um, barrier tapes that we have, and then you can trap them and have a look at them that way, especially under a, even just a small amount of magnification, you can see them pretty, pretty clearly. Finally, a bit on treatment. So again, this relates to all star products, insects, so all SPIs and mites as well. Um, so ideally, it's prevention, isn't it? If we find something that's infested, we move it away from the area that it is currently stored or being made and move any product that's affected away from that area, ideally outside. If it's new stocking, send it back to supplier, send it back to where it came from if we can. And um, possibly treat cracks and crevices with residual insecticides. They are known to still work on product insects. There's no real resistance that's known. 
Um, heat treatment, again, that can work fantastically, particularly if there's an area that can't be cleaned or can't be treated. Cold treatment has got a question mark. Um, like I said about the sort of colder treatment for even in the diapause with the sort of moth larvae, um, they can actually survive some cold treatments. Extreme cold, they wouldn't be able to survive that. They would go into a shock and die. But it's something you have to use really carefully, and that's why it's got a question mark. And it's not every day that you come across a massive industrial freezer that you can put a whole machinery or a whole kitchen into. It's not going to happen. Space treatment could be used with severe infestations, especially good for the moth. Um, they very quickly affected by a particularly space treatment, ULV, fogs, that sort of thing. Finally, if you've got a real extreme case, you might want to look at fumigation and get a specialist in to do a fumigation. Okay, there's a couple of contacts if you want them. Have I gone over time? Sorry. Um, <laughs> there's a few there, but yeah, hopefully that's interesting. Indeed, no, no, I mean, we're, we're a few minutes over, but you know what, it's only going to be me babbling a bit at the end, even though some of the stuff I have to say is very important, but yeah, it's, it's in, you know, people want to hear about SPIs, and we've got six questions in there, um, okay. I'll give, I, we'll, we'll, we might not get them all done, but again, we you can do it's some. It's all right, I'll, I'll nip on and try and answer what I can. Yeah, well, uh, so Dismate Peeg, uh, can you use it for common clothes moths? Um, in clothes like, so um, this may is just a fistia moth or collodia moth type species. So it's only for food moths. We can't use it for textile moths, unfortunately. That would be a good product, wouldn't it? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah, old manufacturers. Indeed. <laughs> <That'd be good. laughs> um, uh, we've got a question about um, cleaning. It, Davina here has mentioned about getting clients to undertake cleaning. It's really hard to do. Yep. Have you got any tips to persuade them? Um, I think my my best thing is to when I when I do my reports, I will literally if i need the site to clean properly i will literally go to town and i will also give that advice of how to clean as well so the worst part is them cleaning it in the wrong way so they'll often do a real brief dry clean and then they'll do a wet clean and sometimes that's the worst thing because it's not clean all they're doing is wetting it compacting it and then you're going to get other other types of beetle in it anyway if they're there so yeah i think real detail cleaning and then proving it by monitoring it and saying this is good this is what you're doing giving them that sort of positive feedback from when they do do something that's good. But mm. aside from that, I just literally go to town and give them every single recommendation I can. Indeed. Yeah, good. That's it. It's trying to get it across in the best ways, talk to them about it, write it down, get them to you know email them it, you know, and I think that's also a good way hassle them with it. Um, there's a, might be a bit too long an answer. Let's, let's give it a go. So there's someone here saying that they've got a customer silos full of corn and yep. they've always got corn weevil infestations for years and they always pop up every six months. Um, they've been emptying them and disinfecting the silos and spraying with deltametrin and Cypex smokes bonds, but it always seems to come back like clockwork. Look like, yep. ugh, like clockwork. Is there anything you can do to put an end to the infestation? So um, the issue with that will be incoming stock. So once the silos are filled, It'll either be from the actual store where they're coming from in the first place and they'll be actually come from the store. So you might have to go further back in the process, further back in the logistics to check those stores and check that they're carrying out the procedures they're supposed to. Because if it's, if it's cropping up that regular, then it's definitely got to be being brought in each time. And you're just yeah. kind of firefighting almost and not treating it as sauce. So it might be worthwhile um, looking at the quality, looking at how that product is stored before it goes into those silos in the first place. Yeah, being checked as it comes in. Yeah, some good good advice. It's complicated with SPIs. It can be. Yeah, it's the, the, it's the, really hard. <laughs> yeah, that's it, the production line. Um, Paul's asked, what would be the most suitable type of monitor to use in a coffee roaster's warehouse, please? Lots of sacks of raw coffee beans and finished. Okay. Um, either go for something like a, a generalised, so AF, or just a crawling monitor, or the MS multi-species, the, um, yeah, the MST. The Exor MST, the blue one, that'll be a really good one because it's got loads of different attractants in there and it's really generalised, but they are really good traps. So, yeah, something like that would be good. Good stuff. Get in touch with your supplier and, yeah, um, yeah. get hold of some of those. Um, what would you consider as an effective active to eliminate moth activity in public space, for example, libraries, especially when all of the traditional preventative measures have been used? So, OK, you know. um, so lots of different things there i'm thinking that it's probably not a food moth it's probably going to be a textile moth <laughs> yeah if it is a textile moth um you have to be really really careful of the products that are stored there so you have obviously got books um it something you could look at is using some of the products that are safer for text using in textile environments and specific textile environments 
um i don't want to mention the brand i'm not supposed to mention it but there is a um a, there is a insecticide that is specifically for areas of sort of precious textiles and areas like that and you'd mm. probably be able to do you'd be able to do a really decent crack and crevice treatment with it plus treatment of the carpets and even sometimes treatment of the where the bookcases things like that um so yeah get in touch with us and we'll be able to give you some more information on that one because i don't really want to say the brand but there is a yeah it's water-based and it's a specific product that's been designed for areas like that that are containing um materials products that would be damaged by normal insecticides does that make sense it does make perfect sense so yeah so <laughs> he is get in touch and yeah have a have a chat to you about it that's great at least you know we know there's something out there that you know can address areas like that yeah um and then the last one from Richard. So what relative humidity do confused flower beetles need to proliferate and flower? Uh, can eggs remain dormant under non-ideal conditions? Okay. So um, they will quite happily proliferate at normal sort of normal conditions. So anywhere from 60 to 65 um, percent humidity, they will proliferate at a normal temperature. So indoor temperature, say 21. Um, that would be fine. They would proliferate at that quite easily. They're like many of the other our insect pests. If you increase the temperature, they increase their productivity. They proliferate even more. So higher temperatures, they'll do that even more. Um, with the stock product insects, it's not as important with relative humidity as it is with something like a mite. They do have that particularly thick waxy cuticle that allows them to balance their water really efficiently. They live in a really, really, really dry product. So mm -hmm. it's not as important, but at normal humidity, normal temperature inside, they'll proliferate no problem. Um, so humidity is not as important, um, but for something like a mite, it is really, really important. Um, with the eggs laying dormant, it's a possibility, but um, they wouldn't be able to lie dormant for a very, very long period. It's like uh, a lot of the phases; they can only survive at a certain time. Um, mm. Again, if it's really dry, mm. they'll again they'll proliferate in that as well. So if it's dry, it's not really going to affect them too much. It's with something like a flower beetle; it's all about hygiene. Great. Good stuff. Well, um, I've got through all the questions, so that's, uh, that's, good. that's good. I really appreciate yeah. that um, with our speed, um, but still efficiency and clear answers. And I really appreciate that, Avril. Um, and again, like you said, everyone, anyone can get in touch with you if they've got any more questions. Yeah, definitely. Great. Thanks so much, Avril. See you soon. Okay, no problem. Okay, bye bye. Um, great, everybody. So, um, yeah, you've got me for six minutes. You all better stay here because I've got some very exciting news to go. And I'm going to get it right at the last minute. And you will all be very excited. Um, so just a, a couple of things, just give you some updates. Um, I'm sure a lot of you might be interested in what's happening with glue boards in the UK at the moment. Um, so in England, uh, again, hopefully you're all kind of aware of this. We're getting it out in our magazine and our e-bulletins, but um, still working with DEFRA on lic the licensing scheme for professional pest controllers. They they have been banned in the UK or will be banned. It'll be for next year. The legislation is there, just hasn't been enacted right now. It's there. It's gone through Royal Assent and it's just going through the licensing and what that looks like for pest controllers. So you can still use glue boards in England at the moment along the lines with the code of best practice, of course. Um, make sure you, you follow that. Um, and then when it comes around to the decisions made by DEFRA, what that licensing will look like, we will, of course, let everybody know. But it'll be it'll be next year, uh, the, the first quarter, we'd imagine. But, you know, we'll still, we'll let you know. So licensing in England. Um, in Wales, for anybody that works there or maybe crosses into the border, it's the Agricultural Wales Bill that has been passed. Um, Royal Assent was on the 17th of August. And it is a ban on the use of glue boards effective as of 17th of October. So 17th of October, which is what, 13 days away, um, they are going to be banned in Wales. Um, there is no allowance for licensing for professionals at all. Um, so after that date, you will not be able to use them. Um, you know, we still always like to hear from members and get feedback on the impact for members, because it's always something we want to keep talking about and have some influence if we can. But any feedback you have, get in touch with um, hello at bbca.org.uk or put me an email. Don't mind that. I can forward it on. So that's Wales in, in Scotland. So having given evidence to the committee and scrutinising the bill and 
challenging the you know financial memorandum that started the banning of glue traps um basically them saying that it would have no financial impact on the scottish business um which it would uh, we're awaiting the report from the committee which will give us a good insight to which direction they may take um but they're possibly going along similar lines to wales in terms of, of banning them but that's still in the stages of waiting for uh feedback and information um, Ian, uh, Ian Andrew, our, our CEO, he went to a Scottish Parliament um, and meeting MPs on the matter. So we're still communicating, we're working, working at it, but um, it could possibly be a ban similar to Wales. Um, Northern Ireland, there's no discussions about uh, banning them or licensing or need for that because um, they're still, you can still use them in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, we have a comprehensive survey coming out soon, which has been um, developed by the Academic Relations Working Group. It's everything and anything about the industry. We want to know your thoughts on where you think the industry is going, where it should go. There's some environmental impact stuff on there as well that we, we just want your, your, your viewpoint and your standpoint on where you think the industry is going. And that helps us build you know, a better future for the industry, really. Um, excuse me. So that's the the main highlights. Um, just a, I mentioned Pestex earlier. We're I think over seventy five percent sold out on exhibition stands now. Um, but registrations are open for you to attend. So I did mention the beginning, but really important if you want to get there in March. Um, it's going to be a great couple of days. So filled with all the latest pest management um, products and information. Um, and probably another little game on a stand. We all like a game, don't we? I'm very competitive, as my BPCA uh, colleagues know. <laughs> but all all fun though. Um, we've got loads of online learning courses, um, lots of CPD there, so please have a look on our website. You'll see me again on the 18th of October. I've got a health and safety webinar that I'm doing for small businesses. So anybody sort of a, you know, 10 employees or under or an SME, um, I'm going to be going through what you need to do in terms of health and safety. Um, so make sure you come along to that. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, if you're in Northern Ireland, we've we've got some uh, networking events, 19th of October, a breakfast in Newry, and then an evening in Antrim. So uh, make sure you get to that. Um, the other bit I just wanted to mention, so um, CPD again, like I said, three points, you've all registered. If you're watching this later on, any of this, you can get those points registered yourself. And in terms of my exciting news that I was going to tell you, I was just saying that to keep you all on so that you'd listen to me. Um, did it work? Yeah, the exciting news is Pestex coming up in March. So I can't believe it. Um, always good fun. And hopefully you see loads of you there and come and come and say hello on the stand. Um, but for now, thank you to all our speakers. Um, you know, we're talking about foxes and uh, SPIs and bed bugs. It's yeah, we've had a big wide variety of topics today and some business talk there from Hazel as well. And a special thank you to Richard, our um, FMNV, our sponsors today. Uh, great new product, exciting. And hopefully, yeah, you all got some good learning and good CPD and enjoyed. So thank you all. Have a great day. And on that note, we'll see you all soon. Okay, bye.